Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It looks like we might be seeing the season start to turn around for the Calgary Flames. I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, why don't we jump into looking at the games the Flames played this week? Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. We got four to cover this week, so let's get this underway. The Flames continued their season-long road trip of five games. It started with the Heritage Classic in Regina, and then the team rolled into Raleigh, North Carolina for this game against the Carolina Hurricanes. The Flames started well, maybe didn't end the game as well, and they ended up losing this game to a 2-1 to score against the Hurricanes. What were your thoughts, Matt? I thought the Flames played fairly well in the first 40 minutes and really should have had a 2 or 3 nothing lead based on the style of play. And then they went into a defensive shell in the third period and just could not get anything going. The Flames started off well, which is the opposite of what we usually see. Usually they finish well. They had a lot of chances. They were generating a lot of offense in the first two periods. And I don't know what happened, but they came out in the third. That offense seemed to all be gone when they came back on the ice, and they seemed to just be reacting to the Carolina Hurricanes and what their offense was doing. Well, and this is the time to do this kind of a thing. Like They saw how Washington, you know, and I've always been an advocate of look at the teams that win, what they do. And they were able, in the game against Calgary previously, to play a very similar run-and-gun style of game that the Flames played. But then the third period, they just shut it down and were opportunistic and capitalized and ended up winning. And the Flames don't know how to do that. And the only way to do it is to learn on the fly and figure it out in games. And there needs to be a balance between like going into shutdown mode while being opportunistic, but they have to figure out how to effectively do that in the first place. And that's something that, like, it sucks that you lost the game. But if they can stick with learning how to play this shutdown style, in the long run, that will be a hugely beneficial thing for this team. Because teams that tend to be good playoff teams and good Stanley Cup contending teams need to be able to shift on the fly in the game and like if they get up by two or three be able to lock that whole thing down and if calgary's players can learn how to do that effectively while not just you know holding the you know like getting blown out like they were in the carolina game if they can manage to keep things going then and be able to be opportunistic when the other team gives them something, then I think they'll be okay in the long run. It just, it's frustrating when you're in the midst of a losing stretch to have another game slip away from you. I think we have to give the Flames credit that early on in the game, we did see some success there and we were seeing them play a better game, more structurally sound game. Um, If we look at three major metrics, blocks, shots, and turnovers, the Flames led the game in all three of those, and those are stats that have maybe haunted this team this season. So I was glad to see those numbers starting to turn around. So, yeah, there were some issues here, but I think overall we have to look at this game as a big positive for the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and like on an average night, the Flames probably score another two goals in that game. It's Mrazek did a very good job, and he usually plays the Flames tough from what my memory of him is anyway. I don't want to say that Peter Mrazek stole that game for the Hurricanes, but he was definitely a big part of their win. He held them in and gave them a shot to win. And that's that Svechnikov goal was kind of all right. And the next game continued the road trip as the Calgary Flames rolled into Nashville to take on the scary good Nashville Predators on Halloween. This game didn't start as well as the last one did for the Flames. If you take a look, they didn't get their first shot until 4.33 on the scoreboard. So they went almost, what, 15 minutes just over without getting a shot. Um, And at the end of the first, the shots were 14-4 in favor of Nashville. But the Flames definitely straightened this one out near the end. And I thought it was uh, a good result for the Flames overall. What were your thoughts, Matt? 
Uh, yeah, the this is uh, the first forty minutes. Like after, like even the second period, I even posted on Calgary Puck that like I was hoping that like if they're gonna continue to play like that, that it was gonna be like a nine-one Pittsburgh style game from last year, just because of the fact that you know something to wake these guys up and because like that that was one of the most abysmal first 40 minutes i've seen this team put up in a long time pretty much since that pittsburgh game you could and, really see the calgary flames struggling against a good team in this league in those first 40 minutes yeah like they couldn't even make a, a pass that was five feet without something screwing up like it was just yeah it was a bad first 40 minutes like it, nashville to their credit uh capitalized early and often uh going up 4-1 and then the flames decided to show up at the end of the second period there i thought you were starting to see the calgary flames showing their frustration um they were getting off their game you could see they were getting frustrated with some of the way they were playing and some of the rough stuff behind the net and after the whistles and stuff like that and i was really worried that was going to translate into the third period and they would kind of be out of it because they'd just be angry and off their game but we saw the Flames come back in this one, and we got goals in the third period from Anderson is second, Lindholm is ninth, Quine is first, Kachuk is fifth, and then, of course, Kachuk sealed it in overtime with his sixth goal of the season. Yeah, that second Kachuk goal in overtime, that was perhaps the nicest individual goal I think I've ever seen in my life. Like, that was just, considering the time left on the clock, and, you know, a between-the-legs one-timer to the top corner. Come on. Like, that's just freaking ridiculous. As much as Lindholm is scoring most of the goals for the Flames this year, when Kachuk is scoring pretty goals, he's got really pretty goals, like that OT goal. And he's bailed us out of a couple now. It's nice to see him stepping up when the team really needs him. Yeah, well, Kachuk... That's why he's the highest paid player on the team. And back when we drafted him, I said that this player is going to be the most important guy in the organization someday. And he's starting to take that reign off of guys like Adro and Monahan. And I think that he is taking that next step this season to becoming the premier player on this team. And he certainly has played that way for most of the games, which isn't bad considering missed training camp. What's the official time on that overtime goal? There was, like, what, exactly one second left on the clock, I think? Uh, w yeah, 1.4 seconds when it crossed the line. Like, it just, like, I can imagine Pekka Rene just kind of like, yeah, okay, yeah, you, you can do that, you get the point. You know, like, it, yeah, like, there's absolutely nothing... You know, you, as a goalie, like, you're trained to, like, expect shots from, you know sane places you know not between the legs one-timers like for some reason it just doesn't you know like oh he's putting the stick between the legs i must put my glove up to the top corner like it does doesn't jump to mind so i can understand why that one beat renee because yeah there's nothing the goalie could do on that one you know this brings to mind the question you and i asked of this team so many times last season which is we know they can play this way in the third, but where was this team the whole game? Like, this is why, like, back when, like, we did our preseason predictions, like, I was very optimistic with, like, I think I said 121 for points. Because the talent is there, and they should be one of the best teams. And, like, when they actually show up and are cohesive, they are virtually unbeatable. It, the problem that for the first like month and a bit has been that you don't really know what you're getting from shift to shift game to game and like even in this game like if after the second period if you said to me that the flames win this game 6-5 in overtime i'd be thinking that uh you got something in your trick-or-treat bag that wasn't very good <laughs> I'm just checking here to see what your prediction was before the season started for total points for this team. Yes, you did say 121. And I don't think that they hit that. Uh, I said 115, way. which is looking a little more realistic. I I think that, uh, I, you know, unless things change, like 102, 103 would be probably if that. <laughs> This game was like so many we saw last season, where it's almost like, let's spot the other team the first 40 minutes, and we'll just beat them in the last 20. Oh, I know. And that's the thing. Like, this team, 
has the talent where like if they're just going very few teams can stand in their way it's just getting that kind of effort to be consistent throughout games and figuring out ways of shutting down other teams when they're trying to come back on you well, the next game was November 2nd, and this was probably a much better overall game for the Calgary Flames. They played against the Columbus Blue Jackets, and Sean Monaghan got his first goal in 14 games. David Riddick stopped all 37 shots that were sent his way as the Flames won this one 3 um, 0. Probably a much more complete effort from the Flames than the last couple that we talked about. Matt, what are your thoughts? Uh, Columbus is not a very good hockey team, and they. I. <sighs> I think you could feel the momentum from the third period of the last game coming through in this game. Yeah. Like this wasn't just the Flames playing a lousy team. I thought the Flames oh, looked really good in this game. Yeah, for sure. And Columbus, uh, I felt that they only had maybe two or three good scoring chances in the entire game, even though they had forty three shots. Like there wasn't like any time. Like even though they were peppering Riddick with shots, I wasn't going. Oh, they might score here. Like it, it was pretty pedestrian for a 43 save shutout and the flames i thought played a lot better in this game throughout and their shutting down of columbus really actually worked in the third period and hopefully like as they get more experience with that they can work out some of the kinks and um i'm actually going to pull a point from the next game uh one thing that i saw Washington do quite effectively was like when they're trying to uh, relieve the pressure like I noticed that the Flames like when they clear the zone uh, in the third period uh, when they're getting hemmed in their zone they just uh, like get the puck out of the zone and they don't have anybody to just chip the puck deep into the other like not with any consistency and it, like it I felt that, like, in the Washington game, especially in that third period, that they were just chipping the puck out, and, like, there'd be somebody in between the benches who was just there to tip the puck down the ice and then, like, go out on a forecheck while everybody else changed. And that's just a small little thing that I've noticed that the Flames don't do very often or very well that they could change to make their game a little bit better. And take a little bit of pressure off themselves when they're being hemmed in their zone. Because that Washington game especially, I was paying attention for any specific little things in that third period that the Flames should try to work on themselves. Before we go to the Washington game, I just want your thoughts on one of my main takeaways from this game. And that was that the Flames, for once, we see them do it too often, they did not play down to their opponents in this True. game. Too often we see the Calgary Flames um, playing to the level of their opponents, and often because of that, they'll let their opponents back into the game, and it gets to the point where it's almost unattainable once the Flames start to play their own way, and we didn't see yeah, that here. Yeah, I agree. It was a very complete game, and I thought that Columbus just didn't have the horses to like even skate with the Flames in this one. You know, this was a really well-timed game on the road trip. I think after that Nashville game, Calgary Definitely. needed this game against maybe a weaker opponent to be able to get back into things, play their game, and build upon what we saw. And I think if you swap this in the Washington game, I don't think Calgary would Probably. have done as well against Washington building on that game. I think it would have taken away some of their momentum. Another thing we did see in this game, Calgary Flames number 17, Milan Lucic, gets assessed a two-game suspension. He was out the game after this against the Washington Capitals, and he'll be out tomorrow night, the Tuesday night game against the Arizona Coyotes here in Calgary. Yeah, and you never like seeing somebody sucker punch a guy at, like he did in that game, but Riddick has been poked and prodded a lot lately. And, you know, early in the season, having Lucic just go and deck a guy that hit was poking at the goalie might get teams to realize that, hey, maybe I shouldn't go and do that. You know, and if that kind of thing helps Riddick not get abused during the course of the season, like, you know, it is a good thing. It's just that you never like to see somebody just getting clocked like that, but, you know, it is what it is. 
You know what? Sometimes you have to have your goon. Actually, I shouldn't say goon. He's not really in the goon role. I guess you need to have your big guy, your enforcers. You need to have your tough guys. Come tough out guy, and really yeah. establish what the rules are and what you're going to allow and what you're not. And if you you know, allow them to take cheap shots at the goalie, they're going to keep doing it. But if your tough guy says, no, we're not doing this and I'm willing to fight back, you establish the rules of combat, if you will, pretty early yeah, in the game. And like Sherwood was going around in the first period and he hit Shillington with a good hit. And, you know, he was just doing lots of little chintzy things and... You know, the Lucic just had, took exception to that and clocked him one. And, you know, it you don't like to see that. But, you know, Sherwood also gets to learn that you don't, you know, you have to actually protect yourself if you're going to do that kind of thing and be willing to drop the gloves if necessary. And, uh, you know, he's only played three games in the NHL. So, you know, it's a learning experience from him and uh, as well. And... It, you know, hopefully the other teams stop, you know, interfering with Riddick, which has been noticeable over the the past few games. You think it's noticeable the teams are starting to stop? No, uh, that uh, they've been bugging Riddick too much. And so I think this was just putting everybody on notice of, you do this, you're going to get it. And hopefully other teams start to leave Calgary's goaltenders alone. Yeah, I'm hoping so. You know, I don't know if it's just because Riddick's a young goalie or if it's just part of his personality, but we do see it. He gets bugged. It gets in his head. I mean, we saw a couple games ago he started slashing guys because he was getting frustrated, and I think other teams know that, and they're trying to get Riddick off their game, and that's a success metric for them. So I think we need to make sure that we can keep Riddick on his game and preserve that. Oh, for yeah, him. for sure. And that's why a guy like Lucic is important because it gives a little bit of a deterrent to the other teams. I'm not by any means saying I want Milan Lucic to get suspended, but sometimes you have to lay down the law. That's part of his job, and if he gets suspended because of it, he gets suspended because of it. That's the way it works. That's part of the job, I think. Yeah, and it was the same with Zadorov in the first game of the season where he, I think, decked Ryan and with a good hit, and uh, Lucic took exception to it and clocked him as well, and... Like, we haven't really seen many dirty hits from other, or borderline dirty hits from other teams since then. So, you know, if it works, then you don't mind the suspension. I don't want him to keep getting suspended, but once in a while, you know, you've got to stake your claim and assert your dominance, and I think that's all he was doing here. I saw somebody ask online today, what happens if Lucic becomes a goon and they throw him out of the league? Would we get our cap money back? I'm thinking, well, let's not go that far with the guy. Yep. Well, let's move on to the last game of the road trip. This was the following night, Sunday night, in the U.S. Capitol. The Calgary Flames went to Washington, D.C. to play against the Washington Capitals. And this was Washington Nationals night. They had the Nationals players in attendance, and they were giving them a salute for winning the World Series. Matt, I don't know if you saw it, but it seemed like a lot of the Washington Nationals players had a hard time keeping their shirts on in this game. Yeah, that was a little weird, but, you know, you just won the World Series. I think you have the latitude to do whatever the heck you want. Yeah, the fans <laughs> seem better behaved in this one than the esteemed guests for the night. Yeah, well, I think everybody was still a little plowed. Any other fan <laughs> so, probably would have got kicked out, I think. Yeah, virtually anyone, yeah. <laughs> When you compare this game to the last game we played against the Capitals, which was here at the Saddle Dome, and you also take into account that this was a, the second game of a back-to-back -back and Calgary played three games in four nights, I just thought that overall in this one, the Calgary Flames looked tired. It looked like they were out of gas, and it looked like they just didn't have what it took to take on the Capitals. I thought it was a good structural game, but they were just out of gas. Yeah, and Talbot... On a couple of the goals were was kind of iffy, but yeah, you can't really blame him too much. And the whole team just kind of seemed like, let's go home now. <laughs> and like I, that's why I was I was fi kind of figuring and expecting the Flames to lose this one. And so like I was already like penciled in my own notes of like okay pay attention in the third period to what washington does and i was uh yeah so it 
there's a, lots of little minor things that, uh, you know, good teams like that do to protect leads, and Calgary would do a very good job of teaching their team if they were to use, like, what Washington did in that third period to help teach the team so that way when they the Flames are in the, that position to, that they can start to do that to other teams themselves. But, you know, on the whole this week, I thought the Flames were a lot better defensively, and I think that it's just going to be a learning process, and if they can become better defensively, that will definitely translate to more offensive chances. I think that was well said. I think you're right. Ending off the road trip here, there's a lot of good video this team can watch. There's a lot of things they can take away from it, not only on their own side, but also on the Washington side. And when you see a good team like Washington, or I'd even say Tampa Bay last year, there's just a lot of little things in their game, the position of the players, the way they move the puck through the neutral zone, um, keeping the puck yeah. in at the blue line in the offensive zone, like just these little things that take their game from being a good game to being a very good game. And I think if Calgary can analyze some of those small things, not always about the big things, how they score, yeah. how they get in front of the net, but some of those little fundamental pieces of hockey, they could definitely improve the game for the Calgary Flames. Yeah, and like the Flames, like uh, any rebuilding team that's trying to take it to the next level like the first obvious thing is you need to accumulate as much talent as possible and you know sometimes like teams like washington in like 2009 you know they got a lot of talent but they just didn't know how to use it properly and now calgary is in that same spot where they have a lot of talent now they have to learn how to win and that's the key i think for this season is learning how to actually win properly and not just feasting on teams that are not quite as good and like every year there are teams like that where they have a lot of points in the standings but they're kind of like almost paper tigers and like even like a team like minnesota when they were good briefly like you could tell that they were never going to do anything cuz they just there was elements of their game that weren't correct and uh, Calgary in order to take that next step needs to get all those little fundamental things on the right page so that way they can take their game to the next level and something a lot of NHL fans don't take into account is just because you have all the best players on the ice doesn't necessarily mean the team's going to gel those guys are going to play well together you need to bring those intangibles or the X factor in there. It's not just like building a team on your Xbox where you can just grab all the best players. Well, look at St. Louis, for example. Like They were basically the same team other than that they swapped out Stastny for Ryan O'Reilly, which, you know, on the surface, they're about the same points, so like not really a big change. But O'Reilly does things defensively that Stastny does not. And they went from being a team that was very much a paper tiger in the playoffs because you'd always expect first round upset that would be the blues to a team that actually won the stanley cup and they actualized their own potential and uh, calgary is in that phase now where they're they have to transition from getting good to figuring out how to translate that into actual success I think this week was definitely a successful week. We saw some strong play from the team. We saw them come from behind. We saw a lot of good things happening in their game. And I think that now that they're coming home, they're going to be in their own beds. They actually have a three-day break uh, during this homestand. I think that we're going to see a lot more good things happening when they can get off the road, recharge their batteries a bit, and play at home for a little while. Oh, I agree. And... I think some added practice time will do a lot of favors for them. And, like, I, you know, I always want to see this team get off to a hot start, but if they can learn how to win properly now, and they're losing games now, but it translates to a better finish to the season, then, you know, who cares about what happened now? <laughs> you know, that won't matter at all. Yeah, no, that's a good way to say it for sure. If we look at the schedule, the Flames just got off their season-long five-game, two-week road trip. They've pretty much been on the road since the Heritage Classic. 
Now they're coming home to the Dome. They have a game on the 5th, the 7th, and the 9th of November in the Dome, so a day off between each one of those. Then they get a three-day break, the 10th, 11th, 12th, no game. They play their first Wednesday game of the season against Dallas. Uh, Then they get two more days off, the 14th and 15th. And then they have an easy road trip, Arizona and Vegas back-to-back the following weekend. So a lot of home games and a quick road trip. Hopefully a lot of time to build a foundation, do some practice, get this team um, structurally sound, and try to fix some of the issues that we've maybe seen plaguing these guys. That's the hope anyway. So if you take a look at the Flames after this week, they've now played 17 total games. I think that's the most of any NHL team. And they have eight wins, seven losses, two overtime losses. I've always hated those overtime losses. I still like to look at it as wins, losses. In that case, it's eight wins, nine losses. Total of 18 points, which puts us number five in the Pacific Division, tied with Vegas, who's number four for 18 points. And if we look above us, Anaheim has 19, Vancouver has 20, Edmonton has 21 to lead the division. So being that we have 18 points, Edmonton has 21, we have a homestand here. This is not undoable. Like, it's been a rocky road to start with, but the number one spot in the Pacific is definitely within striking distance. Oh, definitely. And Edmonton, you know, is not going to stay there very long. And Vancouver being at 20, that's not going to last. And Anaheim at 19 is not going to last. I think the San Jose Sharks are going to come alive here at some point sooner rather than later as well. To me, like the four teams that are in the contention for the Pacific are Vegas, us, San Jose, and Arizona. I don't really see those other three guys holding on for very much longer. It just goes to show you what a weird division it is when Edmonton's leading, Calgary's fifth, and San Jose is last with nine points. But I think we can probably all agree that things are going to average out here, and I think by Christmas we'll see the equilibrium again. We'll see San Jose near the top, Edmonton near the bottom. Everything will be back the way it should be. Yeah, I agree. Well, that wraps up the Flames' road trip. They're now heading back to the Saddle Dome for some much-needed sleep in their own beds. And Matt, we talked a little bit about it earlier, but if you could sum up one thing from this road trip, one thing that stood out to you, uh, what would that thing uh, be? How would you sum it up? A lot more attention to deal, detail defensively, I think, would be the biggest change. And it's a learning process. Like, this team's never, like, even back to, like, 2013, 2014, 2014, 2015, like, they never relied on defense. It was always, you know, just... Like the fourteen fifteen edition of the Flames, they were the comeback kids, and you know, like then they'd miss the playoffs, they'd be, you know, good again. Like it just, you know, it. This team needs to just now that they have the skill, learn how to take their game to that next level, and that's just a learning process. And they seem to be on the right page for that. I think for me, it would have to be resiliency. I think there's some games where we saw the Flames maybe not get the start they wanted or get frustrated late in the game. And instead of letting it take them off their game, the Flames were able to collect themselves either in a timeout or during a commercial break or between periods and come out and correct their game and not let it get to them. And they were able to play a better either 40 minutes or last period after that. Um, I think that's really the thing I noticed that we haven't seen before this. Mm-hmm. maybe you think differently but I didn't see a game on this road trip where the Flames were really out of it I thought that they were able to compete in pretty much every game um, you know even in the Nashville game when Nashville got up by four goals Calgary kept pushing they kept trying to get themselves back in this and it's something we haven't seen a lot from them there's been a lot of games earlier in the season like the uh, LA game on the 19th where LA got up and Calgary just deflated and you could tell they weren't there they weren't going to push they yeah. weren't going to end up winning the game And I think that was a big thing on this trip for me. No, me either. So I think those are good ways for us to sum up the road trip. Before we move on, anything else about the road trip you want to chat about? Not really. Uh, I just hope that things start to turn around for the team as they get back into their own beds. And hopefully Calgary can start putting some W's up on the board. We know it's going to happen, right? I mean, this is the same team, or let's say the same core, the same top six forwards, let's say top four defensemen as last year, and they were able to do it last year. I think we saw Monaghan get going on this trip. I think Jankowski looked really good. If we can get everybody firing on all cylinders and playing the way they were last year, 
this team has got to come alive here soon. And I think it's just a matter of time that we get everyone engaged and going and it's going to happen. Yeah. And, uh, you know, frankly, being eight and nine with only two forwards playing at their normal level, which are Lindholm and Kachuk, you know, that's actually pretty good, frankly. Um, so, and without the bottom six guys really chipping in a lot either. Yeah, like everybody's been just kind of bad on the bottom end of the team. So we'll see. Uh, I'm hopeful that this team, like once they start getting their legs under them, get going. But you never know with this team. I want to give credit to Mark Jankowski in that Nashville game. I thought he looked really good. You and I have had some negative things to say about him this year, so it's nice to see him coming around. And also credit to TJ Brody the whole season so far. I thought he looked much better than last year. I don't know what he did over the summer, but it looks like he's cleaned up a lot of the defensive lapses he had, some of the holes in his games. I don't want to say he looks like a bona fide number one on a top team, but he definitely looks like a guy who I think should be in our top four right now. And that's not something that we've said about Brody a lot in the past. Yeah. Well, and the Flames are starting contract negotiations with him, so even though they're a ways apart, you know, it might not be out of the realm that he'll be back, and if he continues to play like this, uh, he he should be, but, yeah. Guys always look um, good in their contract year, though. Yeah. Matt, we got a very different fan question this week. You want to jump to that? Sure, why not? Renee Couture, at Rain underscore Couture on Twitter asked us, would you trade Taylor Hall for Goudreau? Finding the cap space for Hall next year would be a big downside, but as much as I love Johnny, I don't believe he has the physicality slash intangibles to help lead us to a cup. Would be a heck of a storyline when considering their hometowns. I followed up and asked him if he sees this as a one-for-one deal. And he said, since Johnny's locked up for a few more years, perhaps he has more value, which may warrant a prospect or pick as well. So it sounds like uh, Rene here, Rene, is looking at this as sending two guys back to their hometowns and the storyline behind that. Let's approach this first as a one-for-one deal. Um, We won't look at adding picks or prospects or anything like that. Matt, does this feel like this would be an upgrade for the team, or does this simply seem like it's shuffling deck chairs and making a move just for the sake of doing so? (sighs) Yes and no. Like, Taylor Hall is a very good player, but he's very much in a similar style as Gaudreau. Like, he's not an overly big or physical guy. He's just very skilled and slippery, just like Gaudreau. He's a little faster and he's a little taller, but, you know, he's not as creative. I think it's just basically, as you said, swapping deck chairs. Now, that being said... If the Flames can find some way of getting Taylor Hall and keeping Gaudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, and Kachuk, then that would be just freaking awesome. And, you know, I there is a way that they could fit him in, and that would uh, basically involve uh, Talbot leaving at the end of the year and having Zagadulin or some other... You're going to need you more know, salary than that. At, and for a leak going, and then probably another couple million dollars plus whatever the salary cap goes up. You could sandwich it in. It is doable. You in know, that case, though, you're almost to... ready to just take a run at him in the summer and not give up any assets now. Yeah, but... So all those guys you mentioned that we'd have to get rid of just to clear the salary, plus then whatever assets you think you might have to give up to get him, be that just Goudreau or other pieces, like that's going to decimate this team. I think you have to make a run from as a free agent in that case. And like put it this way, I would actually be more leaning towards seeing Taylor Hall in a Flames jersey than I would any other specific team's jersey next but season. But the question we were asked here by Rene was simply trade yeah. Goudreau for Hall. But I don't n- no, uh, that to me I wouldn't bother. Like that's you know, it's just like like I, I knew somebody uh, who asked me a question of would you trade Huberdo and Barkov for Monahan and Goudreau and I'm like why? You know, like, it, and it, it's the same kind of thing. Like, yeah, they're all good players, but they all have their upsides and downsides. And, like, there's not really any 
overall difference. So, and like between Hall and Gaudreau, you know, there's not really a huge amount of difference between the two. I do think that Rennie or Renee, sorry for saying it wrong. Um, I do think he's onto something here when he says, I don't believe Johnny has the physicality slash intangibles to help lead us to a cup. I think by the end of this year, if not, let's say Christmas mid season next year, you're actually going to see Matthew Kachuk emerge as the number one left winger, which I think will push Johnny down to the second line. That could very well be. And even and- though Kachuk is a young player, I think he's really going to jump up into a leadership role and he will be the guy this team looks at to help propel to a cup. He'll be the guy that will almost take the team on his shoulders. Maybe not as drastic as that, but he'll be the number one guy that will help propel us there. Gaudreau has, like, even when he first came up, he struck me as a similar archetype of player as Brett Hull, where Brett Hull, when he was with St. Louis, he was just awesome at putting points on the board. But he couldn't take his team to that next level. And, you know, he's a very good complimentary guy, but he just didn't have it in him to take the team on his back to that next level. And yet when he got traded to Dallas and then after Detroit, he won the cup a couple of times, but he wasn't the guy. Like Monaghan and Neuendijk in uh, Dallas and um, Iserman, Fedorov, Shanahan and all the, you know, that all-star team in Detroit you know he didn't have to be the guy and I think Gaudreau he'll probably in his career he will probably win a cup or two or more but if he's the guy he will never do that I think Johnny Gaudreau is a guy who is part of a good supporting cast and I think that you know he and Monaghan are looking good here in Calgary they're playing well as a tandem and I don't know that Goudreau is necessarily going to stand out or take the team on his back by himself, but as part of a, a great top six and the guy who might have a great line mate to help him look good, I think he can definitely be part of that core, but I don't think he's the guy that's going to do it all by himself. He needs a supporting cast around mm-hmm. him. And like Kachuk, he looks more like that, like could take his the team on his back. Even in some aspects, Monaghan has looked like that at times but yeah Gaudreau I don't see that and I think that the Flames need another big forward in terms of like big presence like Lindholm, Monaghan, Gaudreau and Kachuk if they were going to actually try for a cup Hall would be perfect I think in that role it's just yeah we have to find one more really dynamite player I think, to be truly, truly, truly dangerous. If I remember correctly, too, part of the reason Taylor Hall got shipped out of Edmonton was there was some dressing room issues. Yeah, and he's matured. and Like, I wouldn't... Yeah, I think most of that's largely overblown. I'd probably be unhappy if I was in Edmonton's dressing room. Yeah, like, you know, like, when you have a team like Edmonton where, like, the management is clearly incompetent, because you know give me a break you have how many first overall picks and you're still bad um they're number one in the pacific now baby yeah that'll last five minutes um but that you know that yeah of course players are gonna get frustrated and act out because come on you know like they're not getting any help and the team wasn't even built in any way shape and form in a modern way it was built more like you know if that you had dunked that oilers team with hall nugent hopkins everly back in the 80s it would have fit in rather and add well. yourself a number it's, 99 and a number 11 yeah like that team would have been a-okay in that era but you know defense has been a thing since like 1990 and the oilers never really got the memo on that and they never have really and yeah that's why they've been kind of bad for basically ever but that's another day and another dollar (laughs) i've said it before and i know you've changed your mind on this over time but i still think that johnny goudreau isn't necessarily going to finish out his contract with calgary i think we're going to see in the next uh year year and a half that matthew kachuk emerges the number one left winger which will make goudreau a number two 
And I think an affordably priced number two, he's got a good deal. I think when he does get traded, you'll see him get traded to the New York area, uh, Philly, Boston, New York, uh, New Jersey, one of those teams. But to me, it just doesn't seem like Goudreau for Hall solves any problems for this team. It seems like making a move for the sake of making a move. If I'm going to trade Johnny Goudreau, it feels like the return has to be significantly more. I don't know quite what yet, but I mean, right now we need a, a right winger. We need a scoring right winger. I think you need to focus on that. I just don't want to make a move because, you know what, it would be fun to bring a guy back here who's from here. That's not a great reason to move one of your top yeah. assets. Like you, And I think if you like do a, want to go after Taylor Hall, you can do that, maybe, if you can free up the cap space. But do it July 1st. Go after him when you don't have to give up an asset because one for one, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, like you'd almost think of something like Barzal or... You know, like other options as being a possibility, it, it, yeah, like it's really tough because you know trading Gaudreau, like it needs to be a specific style of trade, and th those are always so difficult, and especially with a weird player like Gaudreau, like he's not your prototypical, like you know, like if you wanted to trade Kachuk, you'd know roughly what you'd get for him. But Gaudreau, because of the intangible side of things, you don't really know exactly how teams regard that. And, yeah, it it would be very odd. And I think that, I frankly think that until, like, Gaudreau's contract is up, that he'll be on the team, just because it's a bargain. But, but I think that's why yeah. he might be such an attractive trade piece is that it is a good deal. I think yeah. teams might be we'll excited see. to acquire such a reasonably priced player, especially when that contract expires. Yeah, like that last year of the deal when he's in his prime at 28, that, yeah, that would be a definitely a good thing to lock If you look at what first and second team. line forwards are making these days, the top end guys are between like 7 and 10 million. So I think especially if the cap continues to not rise as fast as everyone thinks it's going to, I think there could be a lot of teams that would be looking for that budget conscious option and Goudreau would fit right into that window, sure. especially when his deal expires. I think just that contract by itself might make him such an attractive piece to move because we could really say to a team, you know, hey, we have this great contract. You want to acquire it? Mm -hmm. um, we're happy to give it to you, but, you know, it's going to cost you some futures. It's going to cost you some picks. It's going to cost you something like that. Or, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what it is. But it just, this doesn't seem like the right move right now, trading Goudreau for Hall. Yeah. I agree. And I would be definitely all over the Flames getting Taylor Hall. Like, if they can figure out some way of doing that deal, great, get them in there. But, it, you know, whether that's during the season or the off season, one way or another, they should be going all out to try and get him. I just don't think that trading him for Goudreau is the right option. No. And especially because of the fact that, like, he's a Flames fan from Calgary and all that, that, you know, I'm sure that if everything's equal that it, you know, and Calgary's looking like a good team, that he'd be more likely to want to come here than, you know. Plus, he gets to stick it to Edmonton, so that would be fun. <laughs> you know, Just quickly looking around the league at guys that I think fit the mold of what we're looking for, a big scoring right winger. If I was going to trade Goudreau one for one for somebody, I think more than Taylor Hall, I'd rather send him to Boston and get David Pasternak. Yeah, same here. I think he fits this team better than Taylor Hall does and addresses more needs than just being a hometown boy. Yeah, like, it, it, frankly, like, if the Flyers offered Couturier and something small beyond that for Gaudreau, I'd be fine with that. Yeah, that'd be good. I'd even say if you want to make a move with Philly, I mean, he's 31, so he's older. you got to be careful taking on older guys for young guys, especially with the cap hits, but... I'd even look at Giroux and a young player. I think then you get a guy who can send your yeah. team for two, three years and somebody hopefully young who will come up after him. But just looking around the league here, looking at some different lineups, especially if we look at the Eastern Conference, I think there's a lot more attractive pieces that actually help our lineup yeah. and fill a need than Taylor Hall. I mean, yeah, it's cool. He's a hometown boy and all that sort of thing, but 
eh, we don't just want to bring in a bunch of hometown guys that really don't fill a need for us. And I think, like I said, Pasternak's a good offer. There's a lot of better options if we're looking at how could we actually trade what we have to address what we need. Send us your question for next week. We'd love to debate your question. You can send it to us at our website, firesidechat.ca. We're on Twitter, at Fireside Podcast. Facebook, we're facebook.com slash firesidechat. Or you can send us a voicemail. Our number is 587-200-7176. Don't worry, Matt or I won't pick up. You just leave us a voicemail and we can play it in the show. Uh, we want to know what you guys have to say. If you have a fancy trade for us like this, maybe you've got a question you want us to answer, we would love to do that. We always love to hear from you guys, and it makes the show so much more interactive. Matt, you had a shout-out to someone that you wanted to give this week. Yeah, uh, Kent Wilson announced uh, he's a writer for the Flames at The Athletic, and he decided to uh, resign from that position and just want to... Hanging up the keyboard? Is that the right saying? I I'm guess, sure. yeah. Um, and I just want to thank him for all the years of his articles and thoughts and we've had a few debates on calgary puck and i haven't always agreed with him but you know he's brought a lot of different perspectives and was a big trailblazer of the whole advanced stats movement for calgary media in general and i think that he had a big impact on how everybody frankly regards advanced stats especially in our neck of the woods and you know i just wanted to wish him all the best in his future endeavors and hope that whatever he's doing next is extremely successful for him and thank you very much for those that don't subscribe to the athletic you might remember kent from his days at flames nation uh, he wrote for a long time there and you know what? I never say never in this business. There's a lot of guys that leave and find their way back. So hopefully we'll get to read or hear from Kent in the future as a Flames journalist. And I'm hoping that Kent gets what he needs in his next stage of life. He's a good guy. I know him. I know his brother. Um, all the best to you, Kent. Thanks for everything you've done. And you never know. Maybe he'll become like the Mary Lemieux of Flames journalist. He'll retire for a little bit. He'll come back, have a couple good years, and retire again. We'll see what's next for him. So next week, we're going to have a new feature on the show. We have heard from a lot of our listeners that you guys want more Stockton Heat news, the Calgary Flames AHL affiliate. And Matt and I have done our best to watch some games, read what's out there, try to give you uh, what you want about the Stockton Heat. But, you know, we don't really follow the team as much as other people do. We sort of just regurgitate what we see, and it's not the best way for us to deliver Stockton news to you, and we realize that. And for those of you that do our listener survey, at the end of every season, we send out a survey to our listeners asking what they think works, uh, maybe what they want to see changed, what they'd like us to do more of. And overwhelmingly, it's been more Stockton Heat news, more news about the prospects in the system. So we want to give you that. Uh, we've gone out and we've actually found a correspondent who's going to join us on the show. He'll be on every couple weeks, maybe once a month. We're going to get a feel and see what's best or whenever there's some significant news down in Stockton. And if you follow the Flames online or you go to Flames Nation, you might have heard of him. His name is uh, Stockton's Finest as he goes by online, Jeff Gregory. And Jeff will be joining us to talk Stockton Heat. He's going to come on the show. He's going to hang out. He's going to let us know what's going on with the team in Stockton. So we have some questions we're going to ask Jeff. We're going to try and figure out what's going on with the goalies down there. How are some of our top prospects looking? How's Dubé progressing? Glenn Godden progressing? All those sort of things. But if you have questions you want to ask about the Stockton Heat, feel free to send them to us. We'd love to add your conversation to this. Again, you can get a hold of us on our website at firesidechat.ca. Send us an email or on Twitter. We are at Fireside Podcast. On Facebook, we're Fireside Chat. So that'd be facebook.com slash fireside chat. Um, or you can call us at our voicemail number, 587 200 7176. We'd love to have your questions about the Stockton Heat, and we'll ask as many of them to Jeff next week as we can when he debuts on our show. So, Stockton's finest, Jeff Gregory, next week here on Fireside Chat. It should be a fun conversation. Matt, maybe you should borrow that name and you can be Calgary's finest. Yeah, no. 
Oh, no, that's right. Calgary's second finest. I already have that title. Anything else about this last week you want to chat about? Well, uh, just, uh, I've, you know, like, uh, after last week, I'm actually optimistic at how this team is going to shake down with how this past week went. And We've, of course, seen some wins before this, but they always seem kind of one-off, sometimes even flukes. But this week, it seems like they put down a foundation and they built on something. Yeah, and it's like they're actually getting their feet under them instead of... And even in the losses, I think we saw good hockey. We saw yeah, it look like they're getting their feet under them, like they're building some structure here. Yeah, and hopefully that trend continues and like we're not coming back next week going, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> well, back to square one. So about that show last week, uh, yeah, all those positive things, yeah, no. <laughs> well, right now we're a week away from Remembrance Day, and I always look at Remembrance Day as sort of a milestone in the season. I always look at it that you've got to have your team sort of firing all cylinders and ready to go, and if you're not at that point by Remembrance Day, you still have some significant issues, it's generally a good sign that your team's probably not going to do it this year. Yeah, and... Like, this team is talented enough where even if they're mediocre, like, they'll still either make the playoffs just barely or be just barely outside. Like, you know, like, and that's, like, if everything goes wrong this year, and barring injuries, of course. But, uh, you know, and we're starting to see the elements come together. And, like, you look at St. Louis, they were the last place team in the NHL until the end of January, practically and yet they put it all together so you know not saying that the flames need to do anything like that but you know it, as long as they're let's not try the st louis approach. no well hey you know lafreniere is good this year and he, he how to win a stanley cup the st louis blues way yes tank for lafreniere throw him in there you have zab Grobny as well already in the organization so profit you know you got two thirds of that line and everything's great. <laughs> but if you do it their way, you're not going to end up getting the draft pick because you're going to go from last to first and end up winning the cup. Yeah, well, I just don't want to go on the, that the Cal roller coaster. Well, you know, the Calgary way of doing the St. Louis method is just suck right through. <laughs> hey, that hey, sounds more like the Edmonton Oilers method. Well, hey, it got us Kachuk. So, you know, it did work that one year. As an organization, I really think the time is now. I mean, they've got the right guys for the most part on the right contracts. Um, you know, I think everything's lining up and you've really got to get what you can out of this team. I think they've got a three-year yeah. window with oh, this current for sure. like, group. It, it, yeah, and then you need guys like Peltier and others to step in and start taking spots and pushing their way into the lineup and all that, but... Yeah, no, Calgary, like, they need to, like, if they keep playing the way they did this week and build on things, they'll, they'll be fine. I know you like to do this, but let's take a look at the Flames' schedule for the month. As we mentioned earlier, they're back at home right now. They have games against Arizona, New Jersey, St. Louis. Then they get three days off. Then they have Dallas here at the Dome. I think a winnable section of games, you can probably go 500 at least in that section, no problem. Uh, then they get a couple days off, the 14th, 15th. They have back-to-back -back road trip, an easy road trip, Arizona and Vegas. Then they come back here on the Tuesday and play Colorado. Then they're back on the road for a four-game swing where they take on St. Louis, Philly, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo. When you really look at this month, I mean, there's a lot of games here that are winnable, but I think also some good tests of this team. And I think as they're trying to get things going, this month is going to be a good test of playing some good teams, playing some mediocre teams, and really seeing what this yeah, team's like, got. Yeah, there's only, like, frankly, three teams this month that are really subpar, and that's New Jersey, Philadelphia, and Ottawa. And like teams like Arizona, Colorado, Buffalo, like they're good enough. Dallas, where they're good enough, where it's an actual test. And you know, St. Louis, of course, Vegas, and Pittsburgh are. I think the big test for the Flames this month is going to be to see if they can do what they did in the Columbus game and not play down to their opponents. Yeah, like none of these games are particularly easy for like you know where you should win that game. Like the Columbus game, they should have won. And they did. 
and they look good doing it. But I'd say the New Jersey and the Ottawa games are that way. Yeah, and same with the Philadelphia game, even though that's a, actually a morning game, which is weird. But 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Yeah, I always hate those games, but uh, yeah, no, uh, the team. Like, they have enough talent that they're going up against where they actually need to play properly to get points. And, like, if they... There's, what, uh, 12 games. If they can win 8 of those 12, that will be a excellent run into December. And, like, things will be proceeding in the right direction. If they they go 6-6 six and six or 7-5, and five, then it's like, eh, I'm not too sure on this team. I don't think this team can really afford to have many more games like the Nashville game or like the Florida game where you're letting the other team dominate the pace, get up by a bunch of goals, and then you come back in the third period and, you know, get the epic win. I mean, those are sometimes fun for the fans to see, but if this team wants to be a number one team in the Western Conference, you have to be able to play, let's say, 40 minutes of hockey. 60 is ideal, but you got to at least be able to play 40 minutes of hockey. And I think if you can't do that you're really going to struggle as a team. You've got to be able to put in the good effort and win those games, not just in the last 20. Yeah. And, you know, like right through until Christmas, frankly, the Flames don't have very many nights off where they're playing mediocre opponents. And, like, after Christmas, like, all the games between Christmas and basically uh, the all-star breaker against mediocre teams except for Toronto one game by that point we might be a mediocre team too. yeah but you know like if the flames can get through to Christmas being on the top part then they'll have basically a month where they're just playing mediocre teams which worries me too if they keep playing down to their opponents like they have been yeah true like that's why I'm hopeful that the lessons from this week get learned and like they can just put those teams away and then just roll all over those kind of teams and just stack win after win. Yeah. You know, and I think the long weekend here, the 10th, 11th, 12th is going to be really good for the flames. They play one more game that week and then they have 14th, 15th off. But looking at the schedule, I think the biggest thing for me that I'm excited about is. Practice yeah. Time. And that's one thing that they've been sorely lacking. I think the flames have played the most games of any team in the league thus far. And uh, well, at least in the West. Um, yeah, no, overall, they've played the most of everybody. So, like, it's kind of hard for them to get practice time when they've basically been playing every other day. Playing or traveling. Yeah. Well, hopefully this month will be a better one for the Flames than October was. Um, it's shaping up that way already, and I'm hoping it can continue. Well, let's look ahead to the next week for the Flames. We've talked about this upcoming week a few times now, but the Flames have three games at home. On Tuesday, they play against the Arizona Coyotes, 7 p.m. start time. On Thursday, they take on the New Jersey Devils, again at the Dome, 7 p.m. start time. And Saturday is a 8 p.m. start time, Hockey Night in Canada against St. Louis Blues. So three games this week. Um, Matt, how do you think we're going to do? Should I put you down for three wins? No, I'm going to go with one. Which one? New Jersey. You think they're going to win against New Jersey? Yeah, and they'll lose the other two. And you think we see Riddick in all three? Yep. Arizona's better this year, and the first game back after a road trip, the Flames typically are awful in that first game for whatever reason, and I don't think they'll be prepared for that game for, again, whatever reason. New Jersey, they'll walk all over, and St. Louis is the defending Stanley Cup champions, and I don't know if they'll have it in them to beat them. So, Yeah, you're right about that first game back. You know, I think you're probably right. I think the Flames are going to probably lose the Arizona game, but then I think they're going to win the other two. I think they'll win New Jersey and they'll win St. Louis. I think the coaching staff is going to really prime the Flames for that game against St. Louis. And being that Saturday night, it's Hockey Night in Canada. And I think if they can get themselves rolling, I think that's going to be a good measuring stick for this team. So I really think that they're going to come out for the St. Louis game and be ready to go. New Jersey, uh, they're not a great team. I think this is a good one for the Flames to to take a maybe a dominant uh, game against, almost like the Detroit game last month. Mm-hmm. And Arizona, I think they're they're probably going to struggle in that game. Unfortunately, like you said, first game back, they usually don't do well. Arizona is a good team this year, 
So yep. it'll be really interesting to see what happens with uh, with these three games this week. It's hard to think that they're going to win all three, but it's also hard to think they're going to lose all three. Like it, it feels like somewhere in there, there's got to be yeah. two points at least. Uh, yeah, I I just don't know if they'll come out to play and like it if they play well against Arizona. I think they actually have a good chance of sweeping the week because I think they'll have a lot of momentum. But. Yeah, uh, I just uh, I'm always leery of that first game back after a long road trip because I think everybody's legs are just a little tired on that first one. They're already looking then. tired. I mean, we saw that in the Washington game. So I'm hoping that a couple nights in their own bed and playing in their own rink is going to help that. Um, I think they left right after that mm -hmm. game to get an extra we'll night in their bed. But you know what? Whether they lose the Arizona game or any of these, I think even if they lose, as long as they're playing a good game and they're building upon that road trip it's still okay yeah as long as they're learning how to win correctly that's the important thing like you know you, you're gonna lose games regardless but as long as you're starting to take those next steps towards the proper direction that's the important thing and if you look back to october the flames did win most of the games they played here at the dome so hopefully that trend can continue and we can get some wins for the home crowd well, Matt, enjoy this week. Uh, I know you're season ticket holder. I'm not sure if you're going to the games, but enjoy this homestand. It should be a fun one, and yep. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening, everybody. Go Flames, go, and best of luck, Ken. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.